Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by David Kiger, co-founder and co-manager of Block Metrics, a mid-sized Bitcoin mining firm using its expertise in capital raises to grow market share. Block Metrics recently completed a $43 million Series B and may even open up an interim round targeting family offices. We talk about the team's background, capital raises, and the Texas Bitcoin mining market. David, thank you so much for joining the Compass Podcast. Really excited to have this conversation. Uh, just prepping yesterday on the phone, talking about what we were going to talk about today, uh, made me really interested because you guys have a different perspective on the mining market than a lot of people do out there today. So uh, again, thank you for joining us on the show. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I think we, we definitely have a fresh one because it's a fairly new perspective. We uh, started the company back in June, as you know. So um, we're learning a lot as we go, and I think maybe we're seeing things a little differently as a result of that. Definitely. So we'll just start off with a little quick intro, bio, how you got into Bitcoin, how you got into Bitcoin mining. Like you just said, you guys only started Block Metrics back in June, so it's very fresh. But the team and yourself has a storied and varied career leading up to Bitcoin mining. Sure. And then uh, that's definitely fed into your guys' strategy as a uh, Bitcoin mining firm. Yeah, it has. Um, I guess I can go on, uh, talk about the team a little bit, if that makes sense. Perfect. Sure. So I can, I guess I'll start with, uh, with myself since I'm on here with you. Um, I actually uh, started off in real estate development uh, many, many years ago. And then from real estate development, I left and started a company called Worldwide Express. And that would be back in 1995. So again, a long time back. Um, it's a 3PL. So think uh, logistics and shipping except we don't own the assets. We own the customers and the shipments. So started worldwide uh, in 95, as I said, and uh, encountered all of the problems you would have as a startup, but much less efficient mechanisms uh, by which you would raise capital as you would today. So I bootstrapped it, literally started it with $50,000. And then you know we've scaled it up significantly since then. Uh, we've had a total of five private equity transactions. Uh, the last one was finished last June. And the transactional amount was $2.5 billion. And then today, we're about a $4.5 billion run rate uh, revenue company. So it's, it's been a great run. Um, learned an awful lot about startups and then scaling a company and making it a big company. And I, most importantly, just navigating all the twists and turns, you know, things that happened that you just never planned or saw coming, um, which is actually, uh, looking back, uh, a lot of the fun of, of, of doing this. So um, so that that's my background, real estate development, and then third-party logistics. Um, as a result of that, I was able to uh, make several private e uh, equity investments, and I can go into that in a little bit. But to round out the rest of the team, uh, co-founders, uh, Keith Spicklemeyer. Um, I've known Keith for 35 years. Um, he's a Texas guy, uh, started off as a lawyer, and then got into the energy business, and over the years has done several um, transactions with energy companies that he started taking uh, most of those public, uh, several, at least three or four of those, um, has extensive experience in, with SPACs. Um, of course, everything going with starting a company and taking it public. So uh, transactional expertise, he has a lot of that. Raising debt, sort of everything you would need to do to take a company from a startup to then taking them public, Keith has that experience. So we're, we're very fortunate to have him on board. Uh, the other co-founder and uh, CEO, Nevin Bannister, as again, an extensive energy background based here in Texas, just like Keith. Mm -hmm. um, Nevin has had several successful startups that he exited from. The most recent one um, uh, was an exit of about $600 million. Again, it was in the energy business. He was a co-founder of that business and it took less than 12 months. So, uh, you know, he's here for good luck as much as his expertise. We hope we can do the same thing, but I'm not so sure. But I think what's what the takeaway would be um, in terms of management is we have a lot of experience from taking small companies and making them big. Uh, we obviously have an energy background here in Texas, which is extremely helpful when you're Bitcoin mining, of course. Um, I have a real estate background and, of course, uh, have taken a small company and made it into a fairly large one and have private equity experience. So that has been extremely helpful as we started Block Metrics back in June. Yeah, six hundred million dollars in in twelve months. Let's talk about cooking. That's some some good uh, cash flow right there. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. Uh, 
the block metrics team is definitely stacked. And the thing that was interesting to me in our conversation yesterday, and I excited to get into this more and more, is the way you guys are thinking about this is different than a lot of the miners that I've talked to. Obviously, I have miners coming on the show every week, whether it be like tiny guys who have a few rigs in their garage and they're just trying to bootstrap something for themselves, stack some sats on the side, all the way up to these large firms like Marathon, which have grown at an exponential rate. They have close to 20 exa hash on the on the books by the end of like 2023. So we have tons of different miners on the show. And you guys might be the first perspective I've seen where you are basically leveraging your expertise in multiple different fields, bringing it to Bitcoin mining, bootstrapping this company and getting it running off the ground very quickly. Uh, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about you guys' strategy as a firm and how you're feeding in all these like diverse backgrounds into it. Uh, you mentioned yesterday when we were talking about how your your eventual goal is to go public with this fairly quickly, uh, which is definitely a little bit different than a lot of uh, small to mid-sized miners out there. That's true. So we really started the company to go knowing that we would go public, certainly hoping we would go public. So we structured it that way from the beginning. I think as part of that, we knew how important it would be to raise money quickly and then prove that we could deploy it and buy hash rate, you know, prove that we understood the business, that we were able, again, to raise money quickly, comparatively quickly, and then buy hash rate with it and scale. So our first round, for instance, <clears throat> we had targeted $5 million at a $25 million pre-money val. Uh, we were able to raise $7 million and then quickly deploy that uh, into buying rigs. And this is, this is back in June. And it was a sort of an interesting time because a month after that, China shut down mining. So our, our entry point was interesting to say the least, because as you recall, rigs, spot market rigs were $15,000 um, and uh, Bitcoin was probably 65000 or so. Um, and I had consulted with someone in the business who had been there a long time at Galaxy Digital. Her name is Amanda Fabiano. I'm sure she'll be okay if I mention her name. Uh, but I talked to her about it and she said, look, the entry point is maybe not the best. Um, she was enthusiastic about her approach. Um, and But then she was also cautious. So, so being an entrepreneur, I focused only on the encouragement, disregarded the cautious part of what she said to me, and went back and we decided to get this thing going. So the good news was we were able to buy rigs for half as much. I think they went down eventually to seven or $8,000 on the spot market. And we attracted investors that were long-term Bitcoin. You know, there were a lot around when it was at 65, but they were sort of there for the froth and kind of playing the top of the market, at least at that point. So what we ended up having was some uh, very confident long-term Bitcoin investors. We were able to raise that seven. And then through our relationship with Compass, which was the first group that we partnered with, we were able to get a thousand rigs fairly quick. We had a colo to put them in and start hashing away. And then that made the second round a lot easier because they saw that we were able to, in short order, raise a decent amount of cash, uh, access hash rate, and then put it to good use and start hashing away. Um, the second round, we started just a few months later. Um, we went around to try to figure out valuations, which is always interesting. As you know, it's a little bit art and some science. And uh, we went to the market at $185 million uh, pre-money, targeting a $20 million raise. Um, so at the end of the day, we raised $43 million, which was, you know, again, more than a, a double from what we were trying to get. We weren't worried about the dilution because we know the time to raise money is when you're raising it, not when you have to go get it. Uh, we also noticed a little shift in the investment ba investor base. They were more institutional, had institutional backgrounds. They weren't investing as the institutions, but they were individual investors that knew what they were doing. So that was another vote of confidence. So we ended up at about 215, 216 post. We were able to buy 5,900 rigs. Again, Compass was so helpful because our mantra from day one, again, raise money, buy rigs as fast as we can. And uh, they were able to find the rigs for us and then help us find a home for them, which after China banned Bitcoin mining became harder and harder. You had a flip of the equation. It was cheaper to buy rigs, much harder to find a place to put them. So, so we're, that's where we are today. We've got 5,900 rigs that we purchased. We have 100 hashing away, another 1,500 coming in in two weeks. The remainder of the 5,900 will be coming in over the ensuing months. Um, we have a, uh, a credit facility that we've negotiated with Bank Prov. They helped us a bit in the first round. We're putting the final touches on that here in the second round. Um, and that would give us access to up to, say, 8,500 to 9,000 rigs, depending on pricing. 
Yeah, before we dig more into block metrics and the rigs that you guys have on the ground and the, the financing and the raises, I want to dig back more into your guys' personal story and, and, and get a feel for that. How did you how did you think about like the founders that you have on the team and the employees at the company drawing their expertise into bootstrapping this company? Because like like you said, June was perhaps not the best entry point, depending on how you did it. I mean, if if you did it successfully, then you're good, right? There's there's no questions there. But looking at Bitcoin's price at the time, sentiment was drawing down. Mining works were still expensive until later that summer. It was definitely an interesting entry point, but you guys made it. And now you're, you know, just close around recently uh, going quite strongly. So what would you say were some of the benefits of the team members that you have on the ground that enabled you guys to get to that point? Sure, it's a great question. I think we're, we're an experienced management team, right? So we've all sort of been there and done a little bit of that. Um, we've all started companies. We've had to raise money uh, before, so that was was significant help. Um, I, I do think the experience, again, the fact that we have um, two of the co-founders with significant energy experience in Texas, because energy is such a big part of what we do as Bitcoin miners, uh, that was a, clearly an asset. Um, I had you know transportation background, logistics background, which I didn't think would be all that helpful, but it turned out to be helpful. With all of the logistical challenges we have, and uh, and we're all very familiar with those, so I think people had confidence in our ability that if they gave us that money, we would figure out a way to deploy that money rapidly. Um, and and I think that was really probably the key thing, uh, as far as like individual contributions. Um, you know, we're all very uh, it's a, it's it's a very egalitarian company that we have. Um, I think we all took the responsibility very seriously of raising uh, capital. And everyone contributed to that. So um, whether it was it was Nevin or me or Keith, and our, we have two other uh, guys I haven't mentioned who will be upset if I don't, um, Owen McCrory and, uh, and Axel Nussbaumer. <clears throat> Axel has a real trading kind of exchange background. Um, he's our real crypto, like I said, exchange trader. He, he gets all of that. And he also understands mining very well. And then Owen is uh, more of a connect the dot, uh, has a big legal background and helps us keep track of all of the sort of the, the transactional details. And, you know, that's a big part of what we do, especially with an eye on going public. We need to have all of that buttoned down. So I just think we have a really well-balanced team and a lot of experience. Yeah, that's like one of the things that's really popped out to me over the last year. And specifically since I started doing this podcast is the amount of people in the space who have been here pretty recently, like they, they weren't doing this for the long term, like even people who have been in Bitcoin mining since 2017, 2018 are now considered OGs. And like, you don't find that in any other industry where someone's been doing it for like three or four years and they're now considered like a veteran, uh, typically, you know, 20, 30 years and you're a veteran. So sure. It's definitely yep. different for Bitcoin mining. And I also love how you can have a different expertise bring it into Bitcoin mining. Mm-hmm. And that expertise is like a gold mine for enabling you to get a, a business off the ground quite quickly. Like you said, the logistics thing, how does that come into Bitcoin mining? Well, actually has a huge importance, especially after last year we saw with uh, the issues after China's Bitcoin mining ban, all the COVID supply uh, crunch issues that we saw in like the Port of Los Angeles. I'm sure a lot of those skill sets uh, fit into the package well. Let's move over to the firm itself. So you guys have about... 6,000 rigs on the ground, 5,900, something like that. Uh, You guys are using JVs to set up these colo sites. Uh, You guys are definitely taking an interesting approach. Can you walk me through the business strategy as it pertains to deploying the capital you guys have raised? Sure. I can uh, be happy to touch on the strategy. So, And maybe we're borrowing a page of this from our backgrounds. I, I certainly am from Worldwide Express, where everything was a partnership that we did or a joint venture. So I did not notice a lot of that um, when we first got into Bitcoin mining. It seemed to me that you had a lot of companies that sort of did what they did. um, And then if you heard that you had to be doing something else, you would go and do that, right? Uh, And so we saw a great opportunity to stick to our knitting. And again, that core focus of raise as much money as we can, as fast as we can, and buy hash rate. Now, that'll morph as we get on down the road, but we knew we had to get scale fast. So we looked to companies like Compass. Again, that was our first real partnership we had. And we have a view that if we are a partner of yours, we're going to go long and deep. So we don't have two or three other people that do what Compass does. It's Compass. Um, When it comes to co-location, they obviously helped us there. But we learned from our banking relationships that 
if we wanted to scale and if we wanted to be taken seriously, we had to have some control over power costs and a place to put our rigs, which meant Colo, which is fine because we have a great background in doing those things if we need to. But we also made a mutual decision, uh, sort of an aggregate decision that, you know, maybe we can joint venture with people that have real experience in that, that are very good at that, uh, put some money into the deal in, in this certain case. And we do have a project in South Texas that's 100 megawatts expandable to 200 megawatts. Uh, we don't want to do that ourselves. So we've got two or three groups we're talking to. And the way that we see this going is it would be a joint venture. We would offer cash equity or stock or both. Um, that's been discussed and it's attractive to us. Uh, the other group of the joint venture partner we would bring in would do the development and the operating of the co-location facility. So that leaves us out as a contributor of capital and probably some stock in, in certain cases, um, a carried interest in that co-location facility. So if there's upside there, we would experience that. Uh, our partner has the upside of owning a piece of a miner, which they all seem pretty keen on doing. Um, and then we have a place, again, to put rigs and control power costs, which really that's that's the whole driver of this business. We actually have a package of four or five of those. And that's where Nevin and Keith come in handy because our deal flow, being a Texas-based miner, and the focus, as you know, for miners is now in Texas, thankful to uh, Governor Abbott for passing real pro-Bitcoin mining and crypto legislation. As soon as China shut down, they determined Texas would be the Bitcoin mining capital of the world. So our, our timing was good again. Um, but I think that's the, the approach that, uh, that we're going to take. Um, it seems to be working well. We have a good audience. We have another four or five deals like that that are smaller in the 15 to 30 uh, megawatt range. Um, and we'd like to do a package of those and then kind of go on down the road from there. So there's so many conversations we could have about many things you just discussed there. And I'm, I'd like to get to as many as possible. The one thing that's really interesting to me right now is seeing how you guys are structuring multiple different deals. You're de dealing with multiple different parties within Bitcoin mining. I think that's something a lot of people who are just new to Bitcoin mining or don't understand the industry or maybe taking a first look at it, they don't know that there's so many different players out there that are constructing all these deals. Let's take a facility, for example. Typically, you have to have a purchase power agreement so you're bringing in a local utility, then you're bringing in a facility builder, then you're bringing in a facility manager, then you're bringing in someone who's purchasing the ASICs, bringing right. the ASICs there, managing the ASICs. You can have multiple different bodies for one mm -hmm. facility. So when you guys are constructing these deals, uh, it'd be great to get a, some description about like how you go through selecting the people you want to work with. What are the criteria you guys go through uh, to enable like a, a profitable long-term solution uh, that's also ethical? And then how? Uh, what other players are you working with right now, if you can name any? So I can't name them because we're under NDA. And we I can tell you we have two or three different groups that we're talking to. All, all very serious about doing this with us. Um, their expertise is from developing to operating. So you've, you've touched on the two parts that are the most important to us. We do have a lot of experience on the electricity power side, on the finding site side. So that deal flow came to us. So their interest was, hey, you've got a site that we didn't know about, extremely low power cost. So we wouldn't have that if it wasn't for block metrics. So we bring that to the table we also bring our experience and, you know, so far in, in operating a, a successful mining company to the table. And then we rely on them for their development expertise in one case, operating expertise in the other case. So the deal may well have three parties involved and a joint venture between all three. And what's interesting is when you introduce one of those parties, like one of the operators with the developer, um, that's the first time they've really thought about working together. So it's it's fun for us to bring this element of uh, of working together in a partnership to the Bitcoin mining space. Yeah, definitely. The, the JV deals are interesting. And I think it's it, it does build some strength into Bitcoin, especially Bitcoin mining, to have those, those joint ventures. Uh, talking about deploying machines itself, I'd be interested to get your, some of the thoughts you had about that process. What was it like at the time, buying rigs, going into the market, trying to purchase ASICs from China? Uh, was it a huge hassle at the time? And how did you come to your decision to use Compass as a provider for ASICs? What was like the criteria you yeah. guys at Blockmetrics were looking at uh, in order to make a selection for your ASICs? All right. Well, I'll share a somewhat funny story with you. Uh, we, 
we were trying to figure out how this business worked. And, you know, we'd heard from everyone how to do it or how not to do it. So I went ahead and um, not knowing a lot, I cold called Bitmain in Beijing. And I don't think that they've ever had a cold call. In, in, That's amazing. In China. No, it was. And, and it was what was what's interesting is Worldwide Express, the company that I started a long time ago, it's founded on cold calling. So I was trying to figure out how do I get a relationship with Bitmain? And I thought, well, I just go do what we teach at Worldwide. I'll cold call them. So I did. And it took about four or five calls. I finally got up into the, the part of the company where I needed to be. Uh, met a guy named, well, I won't mention his name, but um, he was very welcoming. After, he was very suspicious at first, and then very welcoming. And I just said, look, I, he gets like, what's your hash rate? I said, zero. He's like, okay. He's like, zero. He said, well, how many rigs have you bought that you just haven't uh, plugged in yet? And I said, zero. And he said, oh, oh, okay. I said, the answer is zero to every question you're going to ask me. But, but we really want to get in this business. We're serious about it. Here's our backgrounds, which he then checked. And, and that helped again, our backgrounds. Uh, but it was quickly apparent to me I would have to wait a long time to get my rigs, A. B, they were priced up pretty good even directly from them because of the period of time that it was. And so I circled back, I think, to Amanda Fabiano again, and I said, what would you do? And she gave me the names of two or three places to go. I called Compass was my first call. And I just I just got along real well with them on the phone and was very upfront. I said, look, we're new. Uh, we have a little different approach to this business. We're We're good at raising money. And if you work with us, we will work with you over a long term. That's what we do. We'll go long and deep, and we're a loyal, uh, a loyal company. And so they jumped off with us, and we were able to quickly go raise that money, having Compass uh, alongside us, and we were able to buy those first thousand miners, which again were so critical because we were able to plug them in quickly at that point. Now that changed, as you know, over time. It's harder to find co mm -hmm. base now. So, um, you know, we do some directly on our own. Our team gets together and we can find space um, and it can be, you know, three or four hundred rigs at a time. Uh, so I think everyone else is experiencing that. That's our size. Um, and then Compass, again, is helping us find space when we're ordering the larger uh, number of rigs that we are from them. So uh, that's kind of where it's ended up. I could see a time when we go back and do longer term orders directly from Bitmain, but we may not have to do that either. I'm I'm happy to have the flexibility of these short-term orders, especially with technology changing. Uh, you know, we don't want to get too far ahead and miss new technology like they're talking about at uh, uh, various and sundry other places. But um, that's that's kind of where we sit today. That's a great story. Yeah, I haven't heard of anyone cold calling Bitmain, so that's a that's a first for me. It's a first for me. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of I facilities, little, I was a little rusty. No, no, it's great. That's uh, that's the confidence you need when you're kicking down doors in Bitcoin mining. I love it. Yeah. Uh, in in terms of facilities, you dropped a little info about the hundred megawatt site that you guys currently are coloing at, and then you also hinted at difficulties of finding later facilities to add more miners into. Mm -hmm. Walk me back through from June until now what it was like to get machines into a facility, and then securing that hundred megawatt site. Sure. So I think, you know, again, we were, and I don't want this to be an advertisement for Compass, but, uh, but it is. So I mean, that's just who we happen to be working with. Uh, Compass helped us find those co-location facilities. And, you know, they were, they were finding them. And what you learn quickly is that, you know, a delivery date of August 30th probably isn't going to happen. It may be September 30th, and then it could be October 31st. Uh, and, and what was great is we were learning with them because their business, as you know, is growing rapidly. Uh, they were learning which colo developers to work with, which ones are not reliable, which ones not to work with. So our learning curve was simultaneous with theirs that way. We also then went out on our own and we were able to really scour the industry and find our own partners. And so, you know, my hat's off to my team for doing that. Uh, we were very successful in doing that. So what we were seeing is, is this is not easy um, for us to really scale. We probably do need to find a, a place where we have some equity and some ownership and at that same time, we're also talking to bankers about our going forward plans. We were up in New York recently doing that. And then they let us know it's a good idea for you to own and have equity and some control over that process. And that's when the joint venture came together. And then oddly enough, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, Nevin was getting calls uh, from uh, folks that had opportunities for us because of his background again. So the timing was really good for that. Um, we uh, Two groups reached out to us because they had heard that we had this 100 megawatt deal um, under wraps. 
and they were really interested in getting, uh, you know, kind of getting to know us better and then potentially ending up in this, this joint venture. So, you know, we start off with Compass, we go off on our own, find it equally difficult. And then as we're, again, sort of, you know, tracking toward going public, eventually we're, we're talking to our bankers, making sure we're doing the right things. And they said, you need some control. We didn't want to own and operate a colo ourselves. So that was, again, where the joint venture really came in. And that's where we are now today. Awesome. So let's, let's go back into the strategy playbook for a second. because it might be one of the more interesting things about block metrics. Um, looking at like the lay of the land, you guys have about 5,900 machines at this time. You have a 100 megawatt site in the future that you can build out as a joint venture. You have numerous joint ventures with other teams out there. And then you also have a team that has a background in raising finances uh, or raising capital. What is like the long-term play for block metrics? What is your guys' strategy? Uh, just for another quick background here, I, I've talked to smaller miners, maybe from 1,000 to 5,000 deployments. They basically peak there and stay there. And then if you get a little larger, maybe you can go public uh, be a small cap. And then of course, like there's the huge players out there, like the marathons, the cores and, and those players out there who have already gone public or did go public um, through IPOs, SPACs, direct listings, whatnot. Interested to get your guys' perspective on strategy as like a, not as small, but like a mid-tiered size miner. Sure. I, I uh, We noticed what you did. And that is there are, a, it's so fragmented in that sort of mid-size miner category of around 5,000 rigs. And, you know, we extrapolated from that, that that is sort of a natural sticking point for miners. And it becomes difficult for them to scale beyond that unless they have a lot of experience. And and that's totally understandable. Um, And so, again, it was we extrapolated uh, and we figured, hey, we're a midsized miner for for a while, at least we have bigger aspirations. But maybe we could be the group that starts to roll up this midsized miner segment. And that became our focus in terms of our strategy going forward. Um, we had a few that had reached out to us because we finally did some PR. They saw that we were rapidly growing and, and were able to put some financing together. So um, it's something that we're looking at very carefully even now. And this is all just, you know, I'm projecting this. This is no guarantee this is going to happen. But it wouldn't surprise me to see us merge with another miner of equal size, maybe uh, one that has some similar experience that we have and has shown sort of a similar growth profile. Um, that would double our size fairly quickly. I think that would help us, of course, as we're sort of um, on, on our flight path or our glide path, rather, to going public. Uh, but once we were able to go public, and that's you know market conditions permitting, we would then have currency to go roll up those miners that have had trouble finding a way to get out of 5,000 rigs and scale. Um, it would give them a place to go, be part of a bigger platform. And we just have to figure out how that's going to look. But we would have the currency, which would be stock a much easier ability to raise debt as a publicly traded company. Um, And I think we're going to see some consolidation kicking in here in 2022. I suspect it'll be with the bigger guys. And we don't mind being, you know, the smaller guy here at all. Because if you roll up a bunch of smaller miners, you end up with one big one. And uh, so that's really where we're going to head. I don't mind sharing that playbook with you. What is it about small and medium-sized miners that doesn't enable them to grow as fast? Is it just like there's so many constraints with the team? Is there just like not enough resources on the books to be able to do it? Uh, is this similar in other markets that you've worked in? I mean, I, I, um, I tell you what, it's, you know, so in logistics, which is a massive market in shipping, um, this has already happened. So the, the bigger, you know, the, the people, you know, UPS, FedEx, all those guys, they've all gone through consolidation uh, many, many years ago. So that consolidation is now just hitting with smaller shipping companies and logistics companies. And worldwide, we've done several acquisitions, the largest one being a billion dollars, the smallest ones being rolling up all of our agents and franchises. Um, And then, you know, that was probably 100 to 150 transactions there. So we've already seen that happen in not only logistics, but in other mature businesses. It's just not happened yet in Bitcoin mining. So I think the limitation is for the, you know, the people that were earlier in who love Bitcoin mining, and they've done well with it. They may not have the team behind them, or they may not have the experience, or even know kind of to know how to who to call, you know, what questions to ask, kind of how to get from here to there. And we clearly have that. So I think that's what we could offer them. And and I, there's a vast audience um, and a lot of uh, of five thousand rig Bitcoin miners out there for us to talk to. 
I think importantly, they proactively have reached out to us and we just listen to their stories. So I think you've touched on it and, and experientially, I can tell you that's what we're finding out. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting playbook. Uh, I've seen a few people talk about similar things, but definitely not as upfront about like where the Bitcoin mining market is in terms of maturation. Uh, obviously, you alluded to it. There's a lot of big players that are already out there and they're typically publicly listed. I think last year we saw close to 20 firms go public, whether that be in Canada or the United States. And those players are big. They're out there and they can leverage those capital markets to continue growing. But there is this huge swath, like at the middle class of Bitcoin miners, if you will, that uh, is somewhere sitting in that 5,000 plus uh, rig range. I, I kind of want to move over to, to Texas itself and talk about uh, the Texas capital market. So I have this personal theory that it might be not overhyped, but overfunded at this point. And I want to see if you can dispel me of that. There's been so much talk about Texas, 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 and Bitcoin mining. Everybody I know is planting down some roots here to set up a new Bitcoin mining shop. Setting aside if it's bad for the network or whatnot, I know that's a pretty common conversation. Do you think there is enough resources in Texas to deploy all this capital efficiently on a time scale that makes sense for a firm? I do. I do. Um, I've been here for 25 years. I know you're a little newer to it, <laughs> but but have more experience with Bitcoin mining than I do. So so in between the two, we shall meet. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of capital out there uh, looking for quality deals. Um, I think as far as without going too far into the grid and how they're operating and issues they've had. But as far as as, as Texas is concerned and ERCOT, I think they're, they're looking at it now as a way to regulate uh, and modulate uh, you know, the grid. So, you know, they're producing at any given time, 10 to 15% more power than, than people need. But if there's a real peak situation or a traumatic situation, like we experienced not too long ago with the, uh, the snow and the, the, the freezing uh, rain and everything else we had for three or four days, it wasn't that they didn't have enough. They just didn't have the ability to get what they needed when they needed it. So um, they view it. And I think, again, appropriately as a way to modulate and regulate the grid. Um, so they view Bitcoin miners as a real positive in that regard. And you're going to hear more and more about that, I can tell you, from Sessions and uh, a few of the other politicians here that are national in scope. Um, and I agree with them. So, you know, we have found it a positive to be a Texas-based miner. When people hear that, they know that this is the Mecca. This is probably the new uh, center of, of mining worldwide. Um, there is enough infrastructure here, for sure. Uh, the energy is inexpensive comparatively. Another thing I think I would make a point of is the fact that only 20% of the power here is fired by coal. Uh, the rest is natural gas and renewables. And there is a big focus on renewables, uh, you know, in terms of what they're doing in Austin at the, at the state level. So um, I think it's a great place to be. There is plenty of money for deals, but they're not indiscriminate with where they're putting their money. They want to see experience. Um, they want to see people who've executed uh, in the past, if possible. And so I think that's been a benefit for us as a Texas-based uh, Bitcoin miner. Uh, that's really interesting. It's a, a solid argument to rebut what I was thinking there. In terms of future JV projects or maybe just co-location sites in general, are you guys looking throughout Texas and, and putting these machines as close to the energy sources as possible? Or are you pretty happy to find a location that just makes sense uh, for a logistical standpoint or maybe for like deploying a large megawatt mine? I think it's a great question. Um, what we've done to this point is we put them where we can put them. Okay. So we've got a lot of them in Oklahoma, uh, Texas. Uh, we've got a few in Canada and we're, we're, we're testing immersion cooling there. Uh, so we're sort of experimenting with some things that are going on now in the industry. Uh, so we've kind of gone where the space is. Uh, but again, that was the impetus for us to lock something down, listen to what the bankers are telling us the market wants, because uh, that's usually a pretty good tell on where the where the where the market is going to go. And, and we want to focus in Texas. And again, with the backgrounds that we have, the deal flow tends to come out of Texas to us. And that makes it that much easier. So that 100 megawatt uh, site that we're looking at in South Texas is expandable to 200 megawatts. So we could put up to 60,000 rigs in there. That's 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 a nice operation. And again, the, the power costs are very low. It's already been approved. Um, so we're just taking advantage of what we know. So I think we'll probably continue to do both. We'll put our rigs where we can. Um, to the extent we're successful with these JVs, we'll move the rigs over there once the term is up. 
on our co-location uh, agreement. Um, but right now we're keeping our colo agreements to one or two years, anticipating the fact we can move our rigs to the locations that we own part of. Awesome. So two more questions for you as we wrap up. Yeah. One hodling strategy. I, I always ask this to every miner I have on. Uh, I don't know if you guys can disclose it. Some some teams can't. But what do you guys do with the mined Bitcoin? Do you immediately just go and liquidate it? Do you guys hold on to some of it? Do you guys hold on to all of it? Do you even have one firm so that they actively lend out the Bitcoin they mine? But curious to get your take on what you guys do with your Bitcoin. We're long Bitcoin. So we're keeping all of our BTC right now. Um, we're bullish on where it's going to go. I think, you know, selling it now would be selling it short. Uh, and so we're not going to do that. Uh, I think that at some point, would we lend it out? We sure would. And we have some experience on the team again with Axel. I mentioned him earlier. He has real experience with all of that DeFi. Um, mm. Whenever you get into anything exchange related, um, he would be our person. But we also have other people we can go to. So I, I'm not going to say that we're going to just keep it forever, although we're long Bitcoin for the term. Um, lending it out to me is why not leverage it to its fullest? Definitely. Have you found as a follow up here, have you found that it's been easier or more difficult to finance based on your HODL strategy or do venture capital teams out there even consider that uh, when they're doing a raise? They do. They all ask us. And you know what? I mean, if you're not long Bitcoin, why should they be? You know, if we're selling it, their first question we're going to get is, why, why are you short BTC <laughs> and you want us to put money in your deal, right? So we're long. And if someone doesn't like us being long, then we're not interested in, in working with them, quite frankly. That was a great answer. Yeah, no, uh, a phrase I've heard a few times I really like is that Bitcoin miners are the most long Bitcoin out of anybody. We are. You're, you're yeah. buying a bunch of Bitcoin printing machines, so you better hope it goes up in the long term. Absolutely. Uh, just closing out the conversation, I, I want to get your take on where the market is going from here and take the question as you will. Maybe, maybe you just want to focus on Texas. Maybe you just want to focus on mid-sized firms like yourselves, or even if you want to be ambitious, just talk about the, the market in general. But what should Bitcoin miners be looking for going forward into 2022? Um, I, I, first thing I would say is consolidation in the market. Um, and I, you know, if I'm sure if you don't have a strategy now, you're behind the eight ball. I can, I can tell you that much. So you better be picking your targets or your partners. I think it's a time to do that. You know, pretty clear uh, that, you know, we're focused on partnerships and JVs. That is where it's going to go. It just, that makes sense to me. So I'm sure that whether you're large or small, you're probably putting a strategy together in regards uh, to that as well. So I think the two, well, and the third thing is regulation always. What kind of regulation is coming down the pike? Will it be beneficial? Is regulation always good because it increases adoption? Um, and I think the tell there is pretty decent because institutional adoption keeps increasing. And that's a great thing for us to see. Very encouraging, I think. But, you know, if I'm running uh, some, another Bitcoin mining company, I'd be focused on consolidation. How can I get big? How can I scale? Because we all know what's happening in a few years. And that'll be relevant. And then uh, how do I partner? How do I really stick to my knitting, focus on scaling and getting as big as I can without having to do the things that aren't my core competency? So those are the t it reflects our approach to the market, but that's that's what I would say. Yeah, you can't give away too much alpha. You, you <laughs> gotta you gotta have your your company successful right. as well. So we won't give away too many secrets. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hey, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. We can probably leave the conversation there. Those. Really interesting take on just the mid market in general and also seeing mm -hmm. where block metrics is at today. So thank sure. you again. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on.